Hello, my friends. This is Lindy. Welcome to my channel, Lindy's Magpie Reads. Uh, this is actually part two of my Friday reads. I read so many books in the past week that I've divided it into two, and I am focusing on the indigenous content in this video. But before I get to that, I want to tell you about today's short story from the short story advent calendar. If you don't want spoilers, if, um, if you're Mary or um, one of my other subscribers who happens to be also reading the short story advent calendar, just advance a little bit if you don't want to know who the author is or what the story is. So, for the rest of you, it is a story called Something Something Alice Munro, and it's by Robert McGill, a Canadian author, and this story appeared originally in The Atlantic. So, it's about a woman who is writing her PhD dissertation on Alice Munro. Or rather, the works of Alice Munro. Nessa usually made a face when other academics used the name of the author, who was a real person after all, to stand in for the author's writing, saying, for instance, I work on Alice Munro, which made it sound as if they weren't literary scholars but chiropractors, the ones with a poor sense of chiropractor client privilege, over eager to share the fact that they got to crack some serious celebrity back including the Nobel Prize winning vertebrae of one Alice Munro. And I just wanted to share that passage because I have a story about waiting at a bus stop in downtown Edmonton. I was reading a book of poetry by Gregory Schofield and a woman sat down beside me and, and asked what I was reading. So I showed her the book and she said, Oh, do you teach him? And I was nonplussed. I was, I said, I think he could teach me. <laughs> and then it became clear that what she was referring to was, she was asking if I was a teacher that taught his works and maybe that's why I was reading his book. Um, I can't remember now which book of poetry it was. I, I have, um, I knew two Métis women um, on my shelves, but I'm pretty sure I remember it being a yellow cover. So I think it was one of his other books. I remembered that conversation when I read that passage in the short story. And it's a great story, by the way. Okay, on to the next thing. Um, oh, I wanted to let you know that the Vancouver Writers Fest is offering a um, one month digital pass access to 30 of their best events from the Vancouver Writers Fest. So you might have followed me during my Vancouver Biblio adventures. I've got uh, links on my channel if you want to see those if you haven't yet talking about the um, events that I went to and the price is right by the way because although they're suggesting a hundred dollar um, donation for the pass you can also apply to get it for free if you can't afford you know any any amount so there's no excuse some of the Indigenous authors that are featured in these 30 events include uh, Carrie Newman, Billy Ray Belcourt, Brian Thomas Isaac, David A. Robertson, uh, Brandy Morin, and there is also an event with Sheila Rogers where they're talking about Harold Johnson. And I've got more to say about Harold Johnson later on in this video, so stay tuned. There is also a podcast episode from the Vancouver Writers Fest, which is a recording of the tribute to Mavis Gallant that I attended. 
Her Image on the Mirror is what it's called, and it was written by Bill Richardson. So I will leave a link to that below if you want to listen. Now on to the books. First off, a five-star read. Louise Erdrich's Books and Islands in Ojibwe Country. The reason that I picked this up is because of this book. Why, Indig Why Indigenous Literatures Matter. It's by Daniel Heath Justice and uh, he talks about a lot of different Indigenous authors in this one and what he had to say about uh, his favorite book by Louise Erdrich made, that's this one, and it made me want to pick it up too, and I'm so glad that I did. It is a travelogue where she's also um, talking a lot about books and reading, so it's definitely a book for booktube people. Yeah. Oh, loved it. I just loved it. Uh, she has a lot of her own illustrations in it. She goes to see some rock paintings, and uh, so that's why this cover is quite appropriate. I will show you one of the drawings that she did. Wild rice spirit, which she says looks exactly like itself. Uh, a spiritualized wild rice plant. And there it is. She also talks about the special paint that the Ojibwe people have used to create these um, rock paintings. Some of them have been there for 2,000 years. So she says it's like a special um, Ojibwe Sharpie. <laughs> uh, there's a special recipe to make it. The ingredients include roots from a certain kind of plant and oil from a certain kind of fish. Um, so they talk about that in this book. Uh, she also talks about the Ojibwe language. Lots of interesting things to say about that, including Ojibwe Moen is also a language of human relationships. Two thirds of the words are verbs and for each verb, there can be as many as 6,000 forms. This sounds impossible until you realize that the verb forms not only have to do with the relationships among the people conducting the action, but the precise way the action is conducted and even under what physical conditions. The blizzard of verb forms makes it an adaptive and powerfully precise language. Yeah, and she's got more to say about the language. She's got so much to say about books. Here's a little bit. We have a lot of books in our house. They are our primary decorative motif. Books in piles on the coffee table, framed book covers, books sorted into stacks on every available surface, and of course, books on shelves along most walls. They are a sort of insulation, soundproofing some walls and so on. And she also talks about her bookstore, Birch Bark Books. It is an excellent and cheering thing to have a flow of books around you, to see them as they enter, and then take the money from people's hands as they disappear. They must be sold, taken away, get thee gone. Still, besides my daily visits, Sometimes I come to the store at night. I love to be among the books and to fuss them into pleasant order, just the way I love moving plants around in my garden. One of our booksellers watching me says, oh, you've come to love the books again. Being around books is only half about actual reading after all. The other part is talking about books with other people, a rich topic, and yet another is enjoying their presence. Sitting in the bookstore half light, I feel a great contentment. Yeah, I could identify with that. The pleasure about talking about books with you, definitely. Now, I started reading Louise Erdrich's books 
with The Roundhouse, which came out in about 2012. And I've read more recent books, uh, La Rose, Future Home of the Living God, Night Watchman, and The Sentence. And I also picked up her children's book, Birch Bark House. But I haven't read her earlier works, including Love Medicine, and the one that's advertised or blurbed, I guess, on the top of this one, which is the Master Butcher's Singing Club. So if you've read those two, the Master Butcher Singing Club and Love Medicine, um, which of those two do you think I should read next? Because that's what I'm not sure about. I'm definitely going to read them. I don't know which one to start with. So. Next, I'm going to tell you about a graphic novel. It's translated from Spanish. The author is uh, Colombian, Canizales, and he now lives in Spain. He himself is not Indigenous, but this book is inspired by true events that have been going on in Colombia affecting the Indigenous peoples there. So these people who are um, mainly in the Amazon region have been facing violence and forced displacement as a result of agricultural and mining operations. So in this story, Andrea is uh, 19 years old and she is one of those people who have been displaced. So a long way away from their home. They're living in the city of Cali. I will show you some of the images so you get an idea of the art. A total of 38 people sharing a 600 square foot space. This space is divided into two rooms with no windows, a bathroom with no door, a kitchen, and a patio. Hard to imagine? Come on! Just open the pages of an IKEA catalog. Instead of a standing lamp, you have Hector. He's in charge of the flashlight at night. Replace the three-seater sofa with four people sitting on the floor. Instead of a coffee table, we find Isaura lying down. Where you would find a love seat, you have the youngest ones gathering beads and turning them into bracelets. In the place of the TV is Hernando, surrounded by anyone else who wants to follow the soccer game on the radio. In the place where a bookshelf would stand, there are bags of supplies that have been donated to us. So there are a few pages where there's some spot color, like this one here showing the jaguar. And there are flashbacks, like this panel, where it's white on black. When it's a flashback in this color scheme, we know that it's an unpleasant memory. Then there are other flashbacks that are more of a dark sepia tone. And this, these are more pleasant memories that Andrea is going through. There is also a lot of factual information in an afterword at the end. And overall, I thought this graphic novel, it just left a really deep impression and I loved it. I highly recommend it. I'm gonna show you the dedication page dedicated to those who have had to flee, leaving their lives behind May the light in their hearts never fade. And this is a butterfly that has the eyes of the jaguar on it. And it's featured in the story. But also it connects to the next story that I want to tell you about, which is A Blanket of Butterflies by Richard Van Camp. This author is Klikjong from Fort Smith in the Northwest Territories. He now lives in Edmonton. The art in this graphic novel is done by Scott B. Henderson. And I read the 
2022 edition, which is full color and plus has additional content. So the original came out in 2015 and it's only black and white. Um, the new edition has color by Donovan Yashuk. You can hear Richard Van Camp talking to Sheila Rogers on CBC Radio about the origins of this story. It's a very interesting story how it came about. I will leave a link below. Basically, it starts out with a Japanese man who has come to the museum in Fort Smith to collect his family's suit of armor. And there's this Klichon boy, Sunny, who's witness to this going on. Now, Sunny's grandmother is an important character in the story, and on her wall she has a cross stitch of the Dene Laws, which is lovely to see. Uh, the story is great, and it's the first in a series, so I look forward to seeing the next ones when they come out. But I read it in digital format. I got it from Libby, and there is this unfortunate um, misplaced text happening in it. I'll show you what I mean. So the words, I know, are absent from the balloon and they're up in the far right. Weird. And then on this other page, again, there's this empty balloon and you can find the words sort of in the middle of the four panels. So I'm not sure what happened there, but I assume that the printed version doesn't have these mistakes. I hope it doesn't have these mistakes, but there is a quite a long waiting list at the library for the printed version, so that's why I ended up reading the digital one. It's got ninja content, it's got uh, real Japanese history content, it has history of uranium mining in the Northwest Territories. Lots of different elements come together with a um, big fight scene and how conflict can be resolved. <laughs> it was just great. Next up, I decided to buy the paper version of a lecture that I heard in person right as the COVID pandemic was starting. So the Canadian Literature Centre is here in Edmonton and once a year they bring in a famous Canadian author to give a talk. And in 2020 it was Leanne Bedesimasek Simpson. So this was her talk, a Short History of the Blockade, Giant Beavers, Diplomacy, and regeneration in Nishnabemowin. And she used um, four different stories about the beavers to talk about a different kind of worldview, Anishinaabe worldview on current events in this land that's called Canada. Uh, I'll just read you a little bit to give you a flavor. Call out culture is exhausting and no one knows this better than giant beaver and nanabush. These two have been trading witty and not so witty barbs back and forth all over the country and it's been so long neither of them can remember what the original fight was about. But oh wow, did they both ever get a spike in followers. Nanabush had been stalking giant beaver around the internet for months before they lost their trail completely. It took a few days of consulting with their followers to figure out if Nanabush had been blocked or if giant beaver had shut down all their accounts and disappeared from the internet completely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I... <laughs> 
I enjoyed revisiting that lecture by reading it on the page. I just want to mention that this gorgeous cover is detail from a painting by Alex Janvier. And it's also reminded me that I've been thinking about doing a video about Indigenous art used on the cover of books by Indigenous authors. If you are interested in such a video, let me know in the comments down below. Next up is an audiobook that is read by the author, Jessie Thistle. It's called Scars and Stars. It's actually a collection of poetry and at the beginning of each chapter, Thistle has a an, prose section sort of introducing it and that was actually my favorite part of the book each of these prose sections if you're not familiar with jesse thistle's work his memoir from the ashes is outstanding uh, he talks about his amazing life story in that book and then more again in Scars and Stars. So one of the things that happened to him is he fell off a building. He fell, I don't know, three or four stories, survived, but one of his legs was shattered, as you can imagine, including his Achilles. And doctors thought that he would never walk again. But he did, does. And in Scars and Stars, he writes, I drew on the strength of the fallen warrior, Achilles. Over time, it gave me the strength to, to stand, walk, and finally run. I mean that both literally and metaphorically. It helped me do superhuman things, like go from functionally illiterate jailbird in 2009 to a published assistant professor in 2018. And that published work he's talking about is From the Ashes. Next up, I just want to mention this chapbook again. I did bring it up in an earlier video when I went to the launch for Learning Their Names, and it is by two white settler writers, Jenny Edwards and Sydney Lancaster. But I have two reasons for mentioning it here. I actually, this is the second time through that I've read it. It's a, just a short little chapbook. It's only 30 pages long. And it is written in the form of letters between the two writers. And each letter is a, a poem, really. And I want to read just one little section. A weasel has moved into the old farmhouse. We saw it peeking from behind the boots luminously winter white, bold and deadly cute. No more mice. Weasels have strong magic. And uh, they talk about the responsibility that we have towards the land that we live on in these uh, letters back and forth. But I particularly wanted to read that passage because of the final book I'm gonna tell you about Charlie Muskrat, which is by Harold Johnson. Now, I previously told you about his book, The Power of Story, and it is because of that book that I picked up this one. <laughs> oh, and I'm going to read more by Harold Johnson, that's for sure. But first off, here's the passage. The boy, Charlie Muskrat, spent part of his childhood living with his grandparents. Sometimes I would hear Wally, the weasel, scurrying around in the dark. Grandma encouraged him with bits of meat. He never became a pet. You never pet a weasel, but with a weasel in a cabin, you never have to worry about mice. So I did this as a buddy read with my friend Kathy, who lives in Vancouver, and she and I are going to do our final discussion later on today. So 
mostly what I want to say about this is it is a funny road trip adventure. Charlie Muskrat is uh, ostensibly gone out to hunt for moose, but he's in his truck, Thunder, and it becomes kind of like a Don Quixote story. And it is also metafiction because Charlie meets up with the author, Harold Johnson, along the way, and he keeps picking up the same hitchhiker in various forms. And this hitchhiker is the trickster with Sucky Jack. Uh, funny and excellent social commentary as well. And it's a short little book. I loved it. I just loved it. Highly recommend it. Now, if you want to stick around for one final clip, uh, at the end, I am going to talk about this book, which when I ordered it from the library, I thought that it was a dual language book, a children's picture book that is in Inuktitut. It is called Amarjujuk. The author is Levi Iluitok. I got home and discovered there's no English at all in it. So I had to make up the story. And that's what you can find in that final little clip at the end of this video, if you'd care to do that. Getting a child to tell you a story based on uh, pictures in a book, by the way, is excellent for language development. And maybe it's excellent for adult brains as well. I don't know. Anyway, thank you so much for sticking with me and for watching this video. Always love to hear your comments. See you soon. So this book came on hold for me at the library and I knew that there was Inuktitut, but I thought that there would be dual language and I was wrong. So now I have to make up the story myself. I do know from the library catalog that it's called Amajurjuk and it's by Levi Iliutuk, who is Inuit. So, you can tell that it's happening in the old days or the traditional times when the Inuit people were using igloos. And this guy looks pretty scary. Oh yeah, creepy guy. Look at those claws. Definitely a bad guy. Uh, woman with child. Looks like she's blind. And she's handing over her child. Maybe she doesn't know who this is, but she's worried about it. Uh-oh, husband comes home. Well, something. <laughs> child is gone. Okay, so husband is under the fur, so it's nighttime. That looks like his wife next to him, and he's thinking, what to do, what to do? Decides to set out and find their child. Found him. Something is going on. Creepy guy has tied a rope to his foot. Hmm. Not sure what that's about. Clever father unties the foot and ties it to a rock instead. Creepy guy is pulling. The rocks made everything fall down when he pulled. Anyway, he's running away. Father and child are happy. Now they're going home. 
Well, there you have it. I'm a jujuk. <laughs>